Before we resume our study of the Westminster Confession of Faith in the third chapter, dealing with God's eternal decrees, let us offer up the prayer which he has eternally decreed for this moment. Heavenly Father, thou who art the sovereign of heaven and earth, whose counsel stands fast, whose decree has indeed determined without violation of the will of the creatures everything which happens, who hath predestinated this very prayer for illumination, we do invoke thee in it that thou wilt visit us with thy spirit as we continue to study the ways of our God in the decrees he has made and in the creation he has produced and in the providence which he directs. For Christ's sake we ask it, amen. Last time, you will remember, we had gotten through the third section of this third chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith, dealing with God's eternal decree. We take up the rest of this chapter, the concluding five brief sections, with number four. These angels and men, thus predestinated and foreordained, are particularly and unchangeably designed and their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. Now, of course, that would follow certainly and indubitably if God did indeed decree all that came to pass, that uh, the number is precise and fixed, just as Jesus says the very numbers of our uh, hairs are in God's knowledge, then obviously the important things of eternal life and death would be clearly a fixed and unchangeable number. But let me call your attention to the fact that uh, that's not only true if the decree of God is as Westminster has indicated earlier, but for those of you who may have some trouble with the decree of God and are more comfortable, as we sometimes put it, with the foreknowledge of God, let me call your attention to the fact that the foreknowledge of God, which no Christian ever disputes, would also prove the absolute fixity of the numbers. For example, if we all admit that God foreknows everyone who will or will not believe, then that number of everyone who will or will not believe is absolutely fixed, utterly certain. There is no possibility that it will be either increased or diminished. It's well for us to remember that though predestination and foreordination are taught in the Scripture, foreknowledge also is, and foreknowledge will usually carry virtually all the implications of foreordination. That is to say, if it is a fixed truth that God knows everything which comes to pass, and who in the Christian world would ever question that, then things are absolutely as certain as the decrees of God would prove them to be. The only difference is that foreknowledge is an awareness of what has been for ordained, but as far as the fixity or the certainty of it or the fact that the number of saved and lost could never be increased or diminished, that would follow in the minds of anyone who believes indeed that God knows everything that comes to pass. Number five, those of mankind that are predestinated unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid, according to the good pleasure of his will, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory, out of his free grace and love alone, without any foresight of faith or good works, or perseverance in either of them or any other thing in the create creature as conditions or causes moving him thereunto, and all to the praise of his glorious grace. You see, what this is saying is that when God chose to save sinners, 
These sinners, who as we will see in chapter 8, or chapter 6 rather, are totally depraved and utterly indisposed to Him. These sinners have nothing in themselves which could possibly recommend them to the favor of God. They have no works, no faith, no virtue of any sort which would make them commendable in God's sight. They are condemnable only. They are under His judgment. So manifestly, if He has chosen to save some, the choice could only have come out of Him, not out of them, because there's nothing in them which could have recommended them to God. That's the reason the divines insist here this was a matter of free grace, pure mercy. God owed them nothing in the way of favor. Anything they received at all was either common or special grace, utterly, by definition, undeserved. Number six, as God hath appointed the elect unto glory, so hath He by the eternal and most free purpose of His will, unobligated, you see, foreordained all the means thereunto. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, see, that's what I say, the creed is contemplating these persons as fallen in Adam, sinners, and God is contemplating whether He will have mercy on them or not. I repeat, wherefore they who are elected being fallen in Adam are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by His Spirit, working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by His power through faith unto salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. See, people often ask the question, if God has predestinated everything, is, uh, every choice such as this, if He has elected some to eternal salvation, why do I preach the gospel? Why do you believe in it? Why does the Holy Spirit work in the hearts? And so on. What this is saying is that God, no, to be technical for a moment, God not only predestinates the end or the goal, but He also predestinates the means to that goal. Thus Christ is sent into the world. Thus the Holy Spirit is sent into the heart. Thus faith is produced in us, and thus we walk in paths of righteousness. So this is teaching us, you see, not only that God provides grace according to His eternal purpose and mercy, but He actually executes it through the preaching of the gospel, through the sacrifice of Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart, and so on. So the confession is saying God is not only concerned with ultimate designs, purposes, and ends, but with the means to them as well. That's the reason I, for example, as a preacher of the gospel, labor with absolute confidence that God, who could dispense with me with infinite ease, nevertheless is going to use the likes of me as He pleases, and He will not accomplish the salvation of a single soul who have been destined to be saved by the ministry of John Gerstner without John Gerstner doing his job and you doing your job. You pray for people, you work for people, you do everything in your power, becoming all things to all men that you might by all means win some, knowing full well that all your endeavors would be utterly fruitless unless God was going to use them. But if God is determined to use them, then every effort you made make is actually of infinite power and in the carrying out of an eternal purpose. It's a very, uh, some people, you know, it always strikes me as almost comical if it weren't so tragic that some people think that this doctrine enervates human endeavor, cuts the nerve and motive of preaching. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. In my little uh, series on predestination and six easy lessons. I think I mentioned to you an experience I had when I was a young man between my second and third year in college, I think it was. And I had a job with Philadelphia Electric Company and being the summer help, of course, all the veterans gave me all the jobs they didn't want to do, which was fair enough. But one of the chores I had was to separate the various metals in these big boxes 
bronze and aluminum and iron and all, all sorts of uh, things. That was a chore job, tedious to be sure, but I simplified it by one step. I could take one of those powerful magnets they had over the place, all around the place, and pass it through, and it would pull out all the iron. That's what I've been doing for the rest of my life. For the next 50 years, I've been doing that. I hadn't realized that that would be my calling for life, to be passing the magnet of the gospel through masses of people knowing full well that God would attract those whom he would attract by means of my ministry, by means of your ministry, and only by means of it. So, as Augustine has said, we can't do anything without God, and he will not do anything pertaining to salvation of mankind without us because he's pleased so to accomplish his ends by these very humble means. He puts his treasure in earthen vessels. The final section in this tremendous third chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith, oh, I'm sorry, the seventh one, the next to the last, uh, must read, it's a very heavy one. The rest of mankind God was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures to pass by and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin to the praise of his glorious justice. You see, Westminster has spelled out in awesome language there what we all know has to be the truth. The God who says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, has not chosen to have mercy on every solitary individual, not saving mercy. And you remember where that phrase is quoted in the ninth chapter of Romans. It's quoted in connection with the very twin children of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau, God passed by the older and chose the younger, and he chose before birth had even occurred to show that the choice was not of him who ran and willed, but of him who had mercy on whom he would have mercy. The Bible makes it just as clear that God chose to have mercy on Jacob and equally clear that he did not choose to have mercy on Esau. He might have had mercy on Esau and not on Jacob, but as we've reminded you once before, God has no obligation to have mercy, saving mercy on Jacob or Esau, on you or me. It is pure mercy. As soon as you or I think that we or somebody else is entitled to mercy, he's no longer talking about mercy. Suddenly the gospel has been changed into justice. God owes it. And as we said in an earlier lesson, the only thing God owes sinners is the wages of sin. And what's that? Death. Mercy by definition is not owed. Pure grace. It comes from the one who bestows it if he pleases. And here Westminster, to her eternal praise, has faced up to a fact we don't like to hear, but which is spread over the pages of Holy Writ, that God does pass by some in his saving mercy. I may add this one particular note. If any of you listening are concerned about your own state or the state of other persons, we may know very well that God does not give saving grace to everybody. But there is no one living who has not committed the unpardonable sin who may not be the object of eternal mercy. And our duty and privilege is to do everything in our power to bring that person in the sphere of mercy. And any of you listening there, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ why, why, where you are and come to him now, you'll have mercy, saving mercy. And if you don't come, it'll be because you choose not to come, not because any hidden strings are holding you back, not because any invisible degrees are pushing you away. If you don't come 
to Christ, it'll be because you don't want to come. And if you do, you'll raise your hallelujahs to God's praise that he is the one who brought you home to him in his everlasting mercy. The final section, the doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care that men attending the will of God revealed in his word and yielding obedience thereunto may, from the certainty of their effectual call, vocation, be assured of their eternal election. So shall this doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God, and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. This is a great mystery. Westminster indicates that it must be declared and it must be preached, but it must be treated with solemn care and responsibility that it be not misunderstood or that false deductions be drawn from it and that fundamentally it is the most consoling doctrine of all. For those of you who come to believe in Jesus Christ, you know that you are an object of eternal love which extends into eternal life. It puts a dimension of grace under you that you could never imagine any other way. And it becomes, therefore, if treated with proper care as the Word of God and with due submissiveness to it, it becomes the most sturdy bulwark of Christian assurance of which a person could possibly be aware. Now we come to the way in which God works out this eternal decree. Let me remind you for a moment how the Westminster Confession moves. It starts with chapter 1, the basic foundation of it all, namely the infallible rule of faith and practice, the Holy Scripture. And the rest of the 32 chapters following on that are an exposition of what this infallible word does teach. And after showing to us the nature of God and his triune felicity, it then deals with the chapter we have just finished, namely, what God has eternally purposed. Now it moves on to the way in which this eternal God, who's revealed himself in the infallible word, works out in time the purposes which he has had from all eternity. And so we come in chapter 4 to of creation. It pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the manifestation of the glory of His eternal power, wisdom, and goodness in the beginning to create or make of nothing the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days and all very good. We realize this, of course, that God alone existing eternally God alone existing in and of himself independently. God alone being infinite. God alone being unchangeable. He could be the only possible source of anything that is. Oh, here I am, visible, audible to you. Here are your friends sitting alongside of you as you listen. Here's the world surrounding you and so on. None of us exist in and of ourselves. All of us are a result of the creation of this being who alone exists in and of himself. And so the confession very appropriately begins with this discussion of creation, God's bringing out of nothing because there is nothing beside himself. And we are not of his substance, so we come out of that which is nothing. He brings us into being from nothing, and he sustains us from falling back into nothing by a constant preservation from non-being. Now, it says here that he did this in six days. Probably in the 1640s, these divines meant six 24-hour periods. I would say that in the 17th century, there would be no good reason for thinking otherwise. Now, the Bible itself simply says six days, as you know, in Genesis 1 and 2, but the word yom doesn't necessarily mean a 24-hour period any more than the word day in English means a 24-hour period. 
We still talk about the day, meaning the daylight. We sometimes talk about the day, meaning strictly 24 hours. We sometimes say this is the day of a lot electronic power. Uh, 1976 was the day of the evangelicals and such things as that. We mean it, in other words, for a whole comprehensive period that may be a decade or it may be a millennium or it could be, as it were, an indefinite amount of time. Now, normally you would suppose when it says that on the first day God created this, and the second day that, and the sixth day that, that it was probably referring to 24 hours. You realize as far as God is concerned, He could do it in six seconds with infinite ease. One word and it'll all be there in, in an infinitesimal element of a second. And there's no question of power and what God could do. The only question is, what did he do, and what is his word indicating about it? And since it says six days, and since there seemed to be no good reason in the 17th century to doubt that it probably was a 24-hour period, I suppose that's what these people meant. Augustine had thought of a longer period, and some of them did too, but there was no necessity for that. Well, the reason I'm laboring that fact is most evangelicals today just as the one speaking to you, for example, don't believe that Genesis really was referring to six 24-hour periods because we have learned so much since the middle of the 17th century about the world that most of us, whether we are specialists in that area or whether we learn from the specialists in that area generally, are they inclined to think that the world is older than that and that time is more spread out than that and the creation has a greater antiquity than that and so on. And since the word yom doesn't require 24 hours, and since we have reason from those who work in that area apparently to think of more than 24 hours, the reason I say apparently there are still some dug in conservative people who are also highly knowledgeable in the realm of natural science who still are defending the 24 hour proposition. We are agreeing with them it's quite possible and so on. And if the scripture said it, that is so. But since the scripture in the opinion of most of us doesn't require that, and since natural science does seem to suggest that God's actual creation was much more ancient and prolonged than a six-day period, we're inclined to say that. And nothing forbids it in as much as the word day doesn't require that. To put it in a word, the 17th century divines probably meant a 24-hour period. You know, this was the age of Archbishop Usher. Archbishop Usher was sometimes considered the most learned person of his time. And when he calculated the creation of Adam at 4004 B.C., that was a piece of very learned scholarship. He had very carefully computed. His basal mistake was assuming the genealogies of the Old Testament were complete and that the day was an actual 24-hour period. If he hadn't made that mistake, the calculation would have been very, very clear. But the main point here is that God brings out of nothing in a specified period of time, and you'll notice even an increasing complexity of being, man being the capstone of the whole creation, not only the head of all the animals made on the sixth day, but also possessing what no animal did, namely, his own divine image as well. The second proposition which the uh, divines make about creation is, uh, is this, about man's creation, which is of course what interests us most of all. After God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after his own image having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject unto change. Besides this law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which while they which while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. So as we were created in the divine image and knowledge and true, and true holiness, we, you see, were able to continue in that nature, but we were created by virtue of being creatures ourselves, capable of changing from that state. Only God is immutable. All of the creatures are mutable or changeable. You say, we're not going to change in heaven, you see. There's no possibility of falling out of heaven. Is that because we have become unchangeable? Yes. But why are we unchangeable in heaven? 
not because our natures have been changed into an immutable nature, but because God, who is immutable, has promised to keep us from falling forever. Now, he didn't make that promise to us when he first created us. He put us in a state of probation in the immortal words of Augustine, Passa, not only non pecara, able not to sin, but also Passa, able to sin. We were able to change even into sin. Thank God in heaven that will not be the case again. We were able to stand, and the confession points out that enough ability was given us that there was no need for our succumbing to this temptation. What was the temptation? This tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't know, and what's more significant, I don't think anybody else knows, but the theologians of the ages have loved to speculate about that, what that is. Is it pride? Is it sexuality or something like that? You know what I think it is? I have no proof of it. I don't know. I don't think they know, and so on, but if you want my idea of what it's not worth, and so on, it reminds me very much of a desert monk who would train his apprentices in the monastic life of celibacy and so on this way. He'd have them plant in the earth a dry, dead stick. And for one year, every day, they were required to put water in the ground and moisten the ground and water that dead stick. You get the point, don't you? Just as discipline in sheer obedience. That was the important thing about the celibate idea was to follow a particular, whether you understood it or not, I don't think really there was anything more to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil than a sheer test of obedience. Why should Eve never have touched it? And why should Adam never have collaborated with her when she did? Because God said, thou shalt not eat of this tree. And that's enough. Doesn't make any difference what the tree has or what would come from it. God said of this tree, you shall not eat. In the last analysis, my dear friends, the ultimate test of an act of piety is a genuine desire on the part of the pious person to obey what the Lord God has said, and not because it will bring him eternal life, not because it will bring everlasting reward, not because it's the wise thing or the judicious thing or the salutary thing to do, but because the Lord God has spoken. But unfortunately, man did not do what he was supposed to do, and so the human story and the whole history of the race begins, and we face that now in chapter 5 of Providence. Let's break ground on that, and then we'll conclude it in our next study. Number, section number 1 of chapter 5 of Providence reads this way. God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence according to his infallible foreknowledge and free and immutable counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. See, this is telling us now that in all the events of human history, which we call providence, there is not anything which God is not upholding and directing according to his actual purpose. He upholds everything, even those who deny his existence, even those who defy his laws, even those who try to destroy his kingdom, they are upheld by him and they are unable to do anything except what he enables them to do and they are carrying out his will even when they are determinedly themselves opposing it. This is what this first section of chapter, uh, of chapter 5 on Providence is telling us. We'll see what some of the other implications of this tremendous doctrine are when we resume in our next lesson.